Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to the fifth annual Sustainability Summit. My name is Sunny Wismer, and I'm a senior in Community, Environment, and Planning, that CEP, here at UW. I am also a former Campus Sustainability Fund and uh, Environmental Stewardship Committee member. Uh, the summit happens to be a highlight of the very first week-long sustainability festival here at the University of Washington. Uh, we have a lot to celebrate this year. All this week, festival partners across campus are hosting their own events and activities to celebrate this festival across the university. This is a very valuable event historically and especially this year because it's bringing together students, faculty, and staff from across campus who are working on sustainability to discuss, learn about, and make plans for future efforts around sustainability here at the university. It always sparks conversation and connection. I myself have been handing out business cards like candy and for a student to get to talk to some of these exciting people, especially here on our panel. Um, it's been a wonderful opportunity. It's also a chance to look forward to how we as a university and as individuals can have a greater impact on the development of our world. These solutionaries, which you will see in our event program and on the PowerPoint behind me, um, including Boeing, UW Surplus, Artisan Electric, EnviroStars, Waste Management, the University Housing and Food Services, UW Recycling, Keeney's Office Supply, and UW Creative Communications. Uh, we'd also like to give a shout out to the UW Foster School of Business, UW Athletics, and the Campus Sustainability Fund for providing support for the video of the summit that will be aired on UW TV. Um, we are especially pleased that Boeing has sponsored the festival this year at the highest level, the Rainier level of sponsorship. All of these companies are doing spectacular work on developing our community to be a truly more sustainable place, and I'd like to just start with by giving them a round of applause. <laughs> uh, to talk a little bit more about the wonderful things that Boeing is doing, I would like to invite Jeannie Yu, Director of Environmental Performance for Boeing Commercial Airplanes, to the podium to provide a few welcoming remarks. Thanks, Sunny, and um, thanks everyone for being here tonight. Um, it's very a uh, pleasure to be here. Um, as Sunny said, I lead the environmental performance organization and product development for Boeing Commercial Airplanes, and um, we are really glad to be here. Boeing it is really an honor for us and a privilege to be Rainier sponsors this year at your your Sustainability Week. So we're real excited to be here. As a company, we understand that environmental sustainability is crucial not only to our long-term success and to our second century of business here in Washington State, but also it's really important as part of the community and important for all of us to share in that key responsibility we have for the planet we share. Um, soon you'll hear from several of your deans and um, other fellow classmates about the theme, Solving Grand Challenges. Um, solving Grand Challenges is a subject that is near and dear to me because I feel like at Boeing, uh, we try to do that daily. We, we look for opportunities to try to make uh, big jumps and leaps in technology and innovation. I, we think that what we found is gathering people from around the world, expertise from a number of areas, and really integrating solutions in a way that no one has done it before is really the way that we solve grand challenges. Uh, we have to seek the benefit of working together and integrating across, across all of our specialized knowledge. Um, you know, people think of, I, I'm an engineer, so people tend to think engineers solve problems, but engineers do not solve problems by themselves. Um, it really takes a community of folks working policy, education, business, finance, you need the finance guys to finance your projects. And so it really is a community of folks who talk to one another, listen to one another, and learn from one another. And that really is our goal in a lot of the things that we do to solve grand challenges. Um, a grand challenge that comes to my mind in 2005, I think it was, about that time frame, or 2004, a university came to uh, my team and they said, um, we'd like to take these soybeans and make them into jet fuel. What do you think about that? And we just said, that sounds crazy, right? But sometimes I think solving grand challenges means entertaining um, crazy ideas and figuring out what you can do with those crazy ideas. And here we are um, a number of years later um, we were able to take that challenge where people thought it would take 20 to 50 years to commercialize um, biofuels, sustainable biofuels, and really do that in a shorter time period. We challenged a team of folks to fly biofuels in two years. We gave them a schedule, a timeline, and a, a, a focused challenge, and they met it. 
And so it's amazing what people can do. And it wasn't just engineers, it was policymakers, uh, chemists, uh, biologists, policy folks, uh, standards development folks, all planning it together and making it happen. At Boeing, I'm, I also have the privilege of having started as well as um, owning the Eco Demonstrator program that we um, have ongoing now at the Boeing Company. The Eco Demonstrator program is a recurring program of demonstrations in which right now we're using flight test platforms to accelerate technology and innovation. I think it's not enough just to understand that there are things that you need to do and what you can do, but you, we've got to find ways to be a catalyst and make them happen more rapidly. And so how I think of the Eco Demonstrator is we have an airplane, we pick a date we're going to fly, and we say, what can you put on there and demonstrate that you can provide that airplane more environmental performance? And we challenge people to bring those things to the airplane before we take off. <laughs> and that actually gets things to happen faster. And so we're real excited about um, what we're doing there because a lot of what we're doing is learning by doing and um, bringing up the state of knowledge of the whole industry because the Eco Demonstrator works to bring together government, suppliers, universities, all together to develop these technologies and so that um, we can all become smarter together. Um, there's some things that we did in 2012 that you will see soon on our 737 MAX. In 2012, we flew an eco demonstrator and we actually flew some of the advanced technology for the winglet. And so you'll see that soon on our um, 737 MAX bringing about 2% fuel efficiency gains overall um, on that airplane. And then um, we also flew, we flew a fuel cell. You're not going to see a fuel cell on an airplane um, very soon, but we're trying to new things and trying to get out there. And that's really what this sustainability challenge is all about. And really, um, the grand challenge is the sustainability. So I'm real happy to be here. I think grand challenges call on each of us to be great. And to be great um, means also being great with taking advantage of all the skills and knowledge of the people around us and learning together. So I think your week-long festival is a great example of that spirit um, and inspiration that each one of you bring. And putting all those ice to get ideas together, I think it'll be incredible what we can all do together. So I'm inspired um, by a lot of the exhibits I've seen out there. I'm looking forward to listening to the panel. Um, thank you for having us here, and um, let's have some fun. Thank you very much, Jean Jeannie. Um, now, I would like to invite our provost, Anna Mari Kraus, to the podium to provide some welcoming remarks. Great. I'm just going to add uh, my welcome and pick up on a couple of themes that have been said. But first, I want to talk about a couple of uh, important guests that we have here. Um, our regent, Bill Eyre, who is chair of the Board of Regents. And he's retired chairman of Alaska Airlines and Air Group. So I'm sure everything that you were talking about in terms of planes, um, he got to see firsthand. And then I also want to um, mention another guest who actually couldn't be here today, but that I don't think, uh, I don't think it would be fair not to mention her, and that's Dean Sandra Archibald from the Evans School. Um, she's been a tireless chair of this university's Environmental Stewardship Committee for the past 10 years. And these last 10 years have been really important ones in terms of the kinds of decisions and the kinds of commitments that the university has made. And I'm proud to say that her contributions um, have been enormous. And I also want to welcome Dean Lisa Gromlich, who you'll hear um, from in just a bit, in her role as the new chair of the Environmental Stewardship Committee. So welcome, Lisa, and uh, let's thank uh, Sandy so much for her work. Um, this summit is really important partly because of the conversations that get sparked here. Um, just like you were talking about that things aren't solved by just engineers, although you're the first engineer that I've heard to admit that. <laughs> um, you know, here at, at the university, I mean, and that's part of what you'll see with this panel is that, you know, we really think that we are particularly well poised to take on these grand challenges because of the breadth of disciplines that we can bring to any problem. Um, and you're going to see that today from the College of the Environment to health to, to business. And you know, um, if we, in addition to the deans here, almost every single dean, every single school or college at this university has somebody, if not many people, that are looking at sustainability in various ways. 
I'm going to talk about just a couple of the accomplishments so we can pat ourselves on the back and then move forward um, of the University of Washington. We won the 2014 International Sustainability Campus Network Award um, for Excellence in Integration. And the UW is the only school in North America to receive an ISCN award since 2012. So this is really a big deal. It's an international award. We also got, as you know, every year Princeton Review um, rates universities based on their commitment to sustainability, and not just the commitment, but the practice. And once again, we got another perfect score. Um, and uh, we'll hear a little bit more about our number one uh, ranking in terms of save on energy um, that we got um, for our football team. And you know, we'll hear a little bit about the stadium and how that was taken into account. Um, in addition, the Campus Sustainability Fund has now dispersed over $1.1 million to sustainability projects since 2010. And our Green Seed Fund, which was launched in 2013, has already dispersed about $250,000 to sustainability projects. Sustainability is something that we think about with everything we do. I mean, look around in terms of Alder Hall and more and more of our buildings get, you know, LEED um, awards because we really think that this is important and that it's not just important for us to study about, it's not just important for us to talk about, but we as a university have to set that example as we're spending money, as we're building, as we're making decisions. So it's not just about uh, other people. Um, finally, I just want to say that it's so, it's so fun to have students on the panel. I really think, I mean, my experience is that, you know, your generation, much more than mine, quite frankly, um, has been taking these problems, these issues, and facing them head on. And it's no surprise to some degree, because this really is the challenge for your generation. Um, you are going to have to solve um, some of the issues that um, we hope we can help you with, but that are going to be much more crucial um, to your future and to your survival. The other thing is, you know, echoing some of the same themes, is that students bring so much to our work. Um, I particularly enjoy working with undergraduates, um, in part because they ask such smart, dumb questions. And what I mean by that is, you know, as you move forward in your discipline and your career, you start learning that I'm a psychologist. This is the way that psychologists think. And I start thinking more and more that way. And what's wonderful is, you know, especially folks that are newer to a discipline, they don't know that we don't talk about that. That's for somebody else. Or we've tried that before, and we know that it doesn't work. And sometimes those questions that can seem naive, um, I've certainly had entire lines of research that have been sparked by one of those really smart, dumb questions. So I think it's going to be a wonderful um, evening. I think it's going to be a great discussion. And it's going to be a great week. So thanks a lot for asking me to welcome you all. Thank you very much, Provost Cross. And now it's time to start our Husky Student, uh, our Huskies for Humanity Dean Student Panel. I am very pleased to have the honor to introduce the moderator for this panel, my fellow CEP, Community Environment and Planning major, the Campus Sustainability Fund Outreach Coordinator, Anne Wynn. <laughs> Thank you, Sunny. Um, thank you, everyone, for being here. Thank you, Dean and students, for taking a little bit um, out of your day to participate in this. Um, let's start off with introductions. Please introduce yourself, what um, department you represent, and kind of the main projects that you have been involved with. Um, hey, my name is Lisa Gromlich. I am Dean of the College of the Environment. Um, the main project I've been working on in the last several years is being the first dean of a very new college that has brought together two different colleges and a lot of other disciplines to look at the earth as an entire system. Um, and that was a bit of human engineering to bring that college together as well as technical engineering. 
As a researcher, I have studied climate change ever since I was a PhD student here at the University of Washington. In particular, and I was just telling people I'm very distracted by our tables, using <laughs> tree rings to understand the course of temperature variability over millennia. Hi, I'm Hilary Polevsky, and I'm a PhD candidate in the School of Oceanography, which is within the College of the Environment. Um, and so the research that I do within uh, my PhD program is trying to understand the role of the ocean in the global carbon cycle, how the ocean is absorbing carbon dioxide from the atmosphere. And so in addition to my research housed within oceanography, I've also been very active in the program on climate change, um, including taking courses and working with students from other departments within the College of the Environment and also beyond across campus. Um, so I'm interested in both understanding my own discipline, but then looking beyond that to think about how to work with others to understand climate change. Hi, everyone. My name is Chris Metcalf. I'm a second-year full-time MBA student at the Foster School of Business, and I'm also one of the three co-founders of a company called Corvada that's in the process right now of commercializing and bringing to market uh, alternative food additives that uh, greatly benefit and reduce the environmental emissions for our large uh, food and beverage company customers as well as food manufacturers. I'm Jim Giambalvo. I'm the dean of the Michael G. Foster School of Business. And uh, I certainly don't have the credentials that Lisa has in dealing with the environment or Howie or anyone else here on the panel. Uh, but uh, one thing we have accomplished at the Foster Schools, we built two new buildings. I'm very proud to say that they're both LEED Gold. And uh, I hope I get a chance to talk about some of my business experience where we've considered um, large investments in money that had uh, tremendous uh, impacts on sustainability. Good afternoon. I'm Howie Frumkin. I'm the Dean of the School of Public Health. Uh, and I. Uh, am fascinated by prevention of illness and injury so that people can live in healthy ways and thrive. Uh, so even though I'm trained as a physician and an epidemiologist, a lot of my work has to do with looking at other arenas where we can intervene to keep people safe and healthy. I just finished a term on the board of the U.S. Green Building Council, which is the organization that certifies buildings in, in, as LEED certified. And I'm on the board of the Seattle Parks Foundation because parks are such good interventions for people's health. So things like that keep me busy and happy in my extracurricular life when I'm not busy being a dean at public health. Hi, my name is Jessica Lavasser. I'm a current master's student within the Department of Environmental and Occupational Health Sciences within the School of Public Health. My current research is looking at dermal exposures within the home to different chemicals, and we've also looked at uh, dermal exposure to PAHs, which are a concern in the air currently. Um, and I also have an interest in green chemistry, and so that's something I'm looking forward to possibly talking about this afternoon. Great, thank you so much for your introductions. You guys are involved in so many amazing projects. Um, and I guess how the, the Dean student panel is going to work is that we have a couple of questions for you, um, bounce around some ideas, and then leave a couple of minutes for the audience to ask their questions as well. Um, and so jumping right in and sticking with our theme about solving grand challenges, I'm curious what you think um, kind of the top one or two grand challenges you are facing within your field, and also the main barriers that are stopping you from solving these issues. So. I know, tough question. <laughs> Can I get to go first? Sure, yeah. Okay. So there's a number, you know, the sad thing about these sort of grand challenges is you actually have to sort of sort through which ones you actually want to put a name on. And, and for the purpose of this panel, I want to talk about global climate change as a way in which we as humans have come to realize that we are making decisions that are really driving the planet. And, and so both Hillary and myself sort of think at these at these planetary scales, and we are trying to understand what is this long-term trajectory that we are on, and what will that specifically mean for us here in Seattle, in the Northwest. So we, we work between these scales. It's absolutely critical to understand how this whole global Earth system works, because, for example, the oceans, what, absorb about half of humans' emissions of carbon dioxide. And if people like Hillary 
don't get that number right, our ability to predict what will be the impact on, on climate will be, will be dead wrong. And so Hillary is either going to have good news for us or bad news that the oceans will keep <laughs> absorbing carbon. Um, we also, I think, then have a challenge in trying to get people excited. I've spent my life trying to get people excited about the fact, you know, at cocktail parties I'll say, you know, the Earth has warmed 1.8 degrees Celsius in the last 100 years, and you guys should be really excited about that. And trying to understand the urgency of these fundamental changes in the Earth system in such a way that the public can think about what does that mean for Seattle, what does that mean for my life, is actually, I think, the, the challenge that goes with thinking at a planetary scale. Yeah, and so also thinking about climate change, that's really central to my research and central to what I think about in terms of the challenges that we're facing right now. And I spend a lot of time thinking about sort of how much more is needed in terms of the scientific discovery that I'm really passionate about and that's what I do in my career and how much of facing the challenge of climate change has now moved from the arena of figuring out what's going to happen to then communicating it to other people and getting sort of the rest of people outside of these core scientific disciplines to then think about what needs to be done next. Um, and it's been interesting as I've developed an interest in teaching and had some teaching opportunities as a graduate student, sort of seeing what are the difficulties that people have who aren't already scientists coming in and looking at what's happening in the scientific disciplines and getting people to think about the scope of the Earth system, which is really enormous, and recognize that despite the fact that, say, the oceans cover 70% of the planet, we as humans are able to make a huge impact on the oceans. We're changing global ocean chemistry by adding carbon dioxide to them. And getting people to recognize that even though it seems like the Earth system is so vast, um, is so complicated, how could we possibly have an influence on it? That in fact, yes, we are having an influence on it. It's a really large influence and it's going to affect our lives and the lives of those who come after us in the future in a really profound way. So one of the grand challenges that I really think about is how to translate this scientific understanding that's really deepened um, in recent years and then be able to figure out how we can take this knowledge and then pass it along to others and help them be able to make informed, appropriate decisions. Well, I'll, I'll be the first to admit that thinking about things on a planetary scale, I think to your point, Lisa, it just makes my head hurt. Because um, it, it's very hard to understand how you can have an impact. And I'm not sure whether what we're working on is a, a solution for a grand challenge, but you know, every grand challenge starts with lots and lots of other small solutions. And for us, uh, for one of our uh, large prospective customers, uh, if they were to adopt our product, they would actually reduce their global warming emissions by over 5% annually. And I think about something like that as being truly exciting. Um, and when you can find the intersection of that benefit, which matters to the company, it matters to their shareholders uh, to an increasing level, um, and then you couple that with a, an actual business need. So it has to be affordable. It has to fit within their existing network, their supply chain. Uh, companies have to be able to make it. That that's truly something that I'm you know, really passionate about. And when you know, I was actually in a, a class at uh, the Foster School when uh, I heard a speaker from this large food and beverage company talk, and you know, he began by telling us, I don't tell many people about this, but... And when you're lucky enough to have one of those uh, situations happen to you, really pay attention. And you know, to what the provost said earlier, if you're that person that's dumb enough to take on a challenge that lots of other people have supposedly quit at, you, know, you might just get lucky. Often not, but you might just get lucky and find a solution that you know, by not having the conventional wisdom, you might see possibilities that others don't. And I think that's exciting. And if what we're doing can play a role, a very small role in, in leading to an improvement that then when taken across a bunch of other things, you know, leads to a planetary uh, positive, that's, that's a great thing. So in terms of the grand challenge, I, I, I'm going to say something that I think is kind of circular. I think the grand challenge is dealing with sustainability. So first of all, what do we mean by sustainability? Um, at least in business, we usually talk about that as meeting the needs of people today without compromising the ability of future generations to satisfy their needs. 
And the focus is on three things. It's on people, the planet, and profit. And let me give you an example from uh, my personal business experience. So I have the privilege of serving on uh, a company's board, Salchuk Resources, and uh, they're a large transportation, diversified transportation company. Uh, this year, uh, that company is investing hundreds of millions of dollars in two ships uh, that are going to be the world's first large cargo ships powered by liquid natural gas. So what's the people part? They're going to create a tremendous number of jobs in the U.S. These ships are going to be built in the U.S. Uh, secondly, uh, the planet. Uh, compared to burning uh, even low sulfur petroleum products, the pollution from uh, burning liquid natural gas is uh, a fraction of that. And then profit. You know, LNG is really cheap compared to petroleum products. That company is going to do very well, at least until some of the other firms can get in line, get in the shipyards, and start building their own LNG powered ships. And that's going to take them a number of years. So we're going to have a very strong competitive advantage for at least a number of years. But this is, by the way, a two decade investment. These ships are not, you know, you're not running these for a couple of years. You're running these for 20 years. So I think that's, that's what companies need to do. They really need to think about how are you going to impact people? How are you going to make sure people get live, living wage jobs? They can provide for their families with health care, education. How can we make sure the planet uh, for future generations is uh, better, in fact, than it has been for us? And you've got to do that in business while still earning a fair return. I'm not, I'm not saying an exorbitant return, but a fair return on your investment. Great comments. I, I was sitting here reflecting that on the uh, PPP, the People, Planet, and Profits uh, three-legged stool that we always talk about in sustainability, we're kind of lined up along the front of the room here with the people, the profits, and the planet piece. But it's striking that none of us is claiming <laughs> just our own P. No. All of us recognize that we need a three-way P win in order to get it right. Uh, so one of the big challenges is getting enough of us to think outside our comfort zones mm -hmm. that we can span broad problems and come up with very complex solutions that optimize lots of things. So I'd say wearing my, my health and medical hat, the grand challenges have to do with disease trends that are going in the wrong direction. Obesity, sedentary lifestyles, and all of the diseases that flow from that. Asthma, I'll, I'll, I'll stop there, but we've actually got a surprising and and an alarming number of diseases that are trending in the wrong direction. And I'm not even going to talk about Ebola, which is a, a, a cha the challenge of, of the moment, uh, but probably not a long-term challenge. That said, I would echo what my environmental friend said, and that is that climate change is one of the huge challenges. Now, the, the good news story is that at the intersection of those health challenges and the climate change challenge, there are opportunities for co-benefits that solve both problems. I could pursue that with regard to transportation or with food production and generation or with buildings. But just to take one example, transportation. If more people move out of single occupancy vehicles into walking, cycling, and transit use, then we reduce carbon emissions and the impact on the environment. And by the way, we promote physical activity, build it into people's daily lives, and help attack the obesity epidemic. And by the way, Everybody knows what the largest killer of young people is in this country. It's car crashes. If we get kids out of that dangerous micro environment, which is the car, we reduce fatalities from car crashes. So finding those sweet spot co-benefit solutions is a very important challenge and opportunity. And then the last thing I'll say, again, to echo uh, what Lisa and Hillary said, uh, uh, communicating these issues to the public and bringing the public along is really a big challenge. I if only people would do what I want them to do, we would solve these problems. But they don't. Um, now, in the health world, we're pretty accustomed to delivering bad news to achieve behavior change. You have to eat less. You have to exercise more. You have to smoke less. You have to wear a condom, sometimes all at the same time. And <laughs> those are tough messages to deliver. But we've learned a lot from that about how to deliver those sorts of messages so that climate protective, human protective, 
economically sustainable behaviors will become the cool and popular thing to do. And that's, that's the communication challenge we've got as well. Thanks. Um, one of the major challenges that I've seen just as a master's student here, so it's only been a year and a half so far, but um, the compartmentalization of many of the attempts to move sustainability forward have not been very heartening. Uh, it's, it's very frustrating to see so many academics in one place especially who have so many skills and who have so much knowledge about particular pieces of the puzzle. And it's so difficult to bring all of that together with the way that funding can be set up, with the way that grants are sometimes pursued. Um, and I really think that it, there needs to be more open lines of communication, more active uh, collaboration going on throughout the school. I mean, throughout different departments throughout the world, there are so many different opportunities and so many different types of expertise that if we just met at the right moment, things could move forward a lot faster. Um, I think the other issue that some of the health fields in particular may face is this is trying to see where we fit into the larger sustainability uh, issue. I mentioned to Howie earlier that my research revolves around dermal exposures. And at first glance, when you see a grant that says, you know, we're looking for sustainability grants, or we're looking for sustainability, um, we're looking for some problem solving in regards to sustainability. At first glance, you have no idea how, you're, how what you do fits into that. But when you take a step back and you start looking at, we're looking to protect future generations. We're looking to make sure that health can be sustained throughout a population for centuries to come. It starts to fit, but it's not necessarily immediately evident. So those are two of the challenges that I see. Yeah, I see, I see a lot of themes within your answers. One about engaging the public. It's, it's this huge issue that seen globally or locally can be incredibly overwhelming. Um, and so I was wondering if you could go talk a little bit more about how do we get people to act on sustainability when it is such a buzzword, such an overwhelming term? Um, what have you seen has worked um, in, in your work? And um, how, how do we get people to, to kind of care about this idea? If I, if I could volunteer a personal story, albeit a little bit embarrassing. Um, some of you may be familiar with a company called Opower. Um, but the city of Seattle, uh, City Light, hired them um, to basically help with, uh, and there's an environmental and sustainability angle to it, but there's also capacity planning where they know our city's getting bigger, so power companies have to get people to save so that they you know, don't run out of power, because it's a lot easier to get people to save than it is to build a new power plant or build a new dam. And we, got a, we were randomly chosen to participate in their uh, 20,000 household focus group before they rolled it out to the city. And it showed that we were using double what our average neighbors were using in our household. And something like four or five times the efficient neighbors who never, ever, ever seemed to be home. And um, <laughs> you know, my wife and I had looked at our bills. We'd talked about them. We you know, thought we were turning lights off. And when we got that letter that showed us, you know, again, competitive shaming, you know, that we were really bad. Um, one of my neighbors, and I'll just put it out there that it's not true, ac accused us of having a growing operation in our basement because we <laughs> used so much power. Um, and, you know, that was the one thing that when we got that every two months that actually got us to change our behavior. It got me to go down to the basement and realize that I had some backup servers that were supposed to be shutting off and never did because they ran into an error. And suddenly playing detective in my household to figure out why is this room so hot? You know, what's going on? And then as, as we started to do better, sure enough, that line went down and down and down. And we've had times we've fallen off of it. But that's, I think, one of the few examples of it's really hard to moderate electrical usage when you only get a report once every two months. And that's inherently a big problem because you need feedback for it. But that proved to be a big enough feedback with the actual verbal abuse we got from some of our neighbors, too, to actually <laughs> cause us to, to make a change really for the positive. Yeah. Somebody with a backup server in the basement. Yeah. Wow, yeah. that's very cool. <laughs> <laughs> Why don't we start from this side and then work our way back? Can you repeat the question again? Yeah. Um, so how do we get people to care about sustainability when it is such this big and nebulous word? And what have you seen has, has worked in making people act? So I can't speak to what I've seen that has worked, mostly because I uh, 
I'm not really sure of a specific example that I could give you that would be really wonderful, but I have seen things work. Um, I think that driving home the legacy component of sustainability, how this is affecting not just us, but our children and our grandchildren. People seem to take, uh, when you frame an issue in terms of their family, they tend to react much differently than to, oh, 200 years from now, the people who are alive. It doesn't mm -hmm. work on everybody for sure, but there are certain people that they do take it to heart, and that's what makes them change. Mm -hmm. So I'll answer with a couple of uh, things that I've learned from the health world where we have tried to get people to quit smoking and, and things like that. So one of the buzz lines is uh, simple, clear messages repeated frequently from a variety of trusted sources. Simple, clear messages repeated frequently <laughs> from a variety of trusted sources. And, and each of those is a separate communication theme. The messages need to be simple and clear. You need to hear them again and again. And if you hear them from uh, your professors and from your healthcare providers and from celebrities, then that helps a lot. The other is, is make the behavior change that you want to achieve cool and popular and easy. Uh, if, if it's hard to do something or if it takes a lot of uh, reinforcement, it's not going to get done as well as if you just make it the norm. Most of us don't litter on the streets anymore. That was the norm 50 years ago. It just isn't cool. So changing, it, reframing the way desired behaviors are positioned helps a lot to cement those behaviors. So I, I'll take a bit of exception with the premise. I think people really do care, and that's why we see uh, companies responding the way they do. So. You know, why does Starbucks sell fair trade coffee? Because customers care about the growers earning a living wage. Mm -hmm. uh, why does Packard have a plant? Packard builds large trucks. Uh, why do they have a plant where nothing out of that plant ends up in a landfill? 100% nothing goes into the landfill. Uh, why does Walmart articulate an aspirational goal of having 100% solar power? They do it because people care, their customers care. So I think that, you know, so the idea that people don't care about the environment, I, I think people care deeply about the environment and companies that aren't addressing it, uh, they're not gonna survive. So when I think about this, I sort of think that there, there are two different aspects of getting the public to care about the environment and environmental change. The first is sort of what Howie was talking about for making personal behavior decisions, or your example, which I love, about sort of changing your personal electricity use, things that we really have control over in our lives. And then there's the second part that I think it's important to admit that there are challenges to sustainability that we as individuals can't solve just on our own, right? I might be able to determine my own health by my own behaviors, but if I want to change the composition of the atmosphere, that's not something I can do by myself. That requires collective action. And so when I think about climate change and the challenges to that collective action, there are sort of two different pieces to it. There are the people who aren't convinced that it's a problem, and those people are still a significant number, though um, that percentage is decreasing over time, which is really heartening to see that people are being convinced over time. And then there are a lot of people who are convinced that climate change is a problem, that we should do something about it, but it's not necessarily their top issue. They're worried about their jobs, they're worried about their personal health, and they're not necessarily willing to make certain kinds of sacrifices or they're not willing to decide who they vote for entirely based on this one issue. Um, and I think it's I think it's also important to recognize that it's not just that we all decide we want to do something about it and suddenly something happens. I think it requires this sort of difficult collaboration between people from different disciplines, people with different kinds of expertise. We need, you know, businesses, but we also need policymakers and we need sort of everyone to to come together to take that sort of burgeoning public interest and engagement and actually do something with it. So as the final person in the line, I'm going to fill in a little piece that hasn't been said by my very articulate colleagues. And I'm, I'm 
thinking about the, the other adage about communication, which is understanding where people are at versus just putting on a bullhorn and throwing science at them. And I'm very inspired by the work of um, one of the professors in our School of Environmental Forest and Forest Sciences who's a, a psychologist in a forestry program, um, Dr. Stanley Asa, who has done a lot of research about why do people engage in a, say, a sustainability action like restoring the ecological function of a first order watershed in the greater Seattle area, which sounds all sciencey and geeky and basically means fixing up, you know, this sort of area around your home. And why neighborhood groups do it is they're not doing it to restore the ecological function of a first order drainage in their blah, 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 blah. They're doing it because increasing the beauty and the accessibility of the nature in their home and in their community speaks to their values about their community. And so I think understanding where these fundamental values, whether they're about profit or whether they're about how we, we want our, our surroundings to look and what we want our community to be like and the wellness that that implies is a key piece that maybe we never even say the word sustainability, mm -hmm. that it's, it's really about these other values. Um, so we are running out of time, but I was wondering if the audience had any questions that they would like to ask an individual or these groups. We do have mics on both ends. And my question is to the whole panel. And listening to you talk, I'm, I'm thinking about how important it is to collaborate and how important it is for people to care about um, these grand challenges. And I guess I was thinking of just a couple of decades ago, the Montreal Protocol that was passed in order to reduce CFCs in the atmosphere. And that really required tough binding worldwide agreement. And we've known about climate change for about the same amount of time. And I'm just wondering if you see um, the necessity of actually creating a really strong set of legislation in order to combat climate change, or if you see just people's personal convictions as being enough to do that. Thanks, Jim. Uh, I'll take this, and boy, this is not a standard business point of view. Uh, I think with respect to uh, environmental problems, we do need regulation. And I mean, what we have is externalities. A company can be polluting, and the cost, they don't bear the cost. The cost is borne by everyone that lives near them or you know, even uh, hundreds of miles away. So one, one way to deal with externalities is regulation. Uh, and then I think your point about uh, international treaties is hugely important. I mean, when we think about living wages for jobs in the US, you've got to remember the average wage of a, a, a fair middle class worker in China is about $4,500 a year. So we're competing against that. That's tough to do. Uh, in China, the pollution regulations are much weaker than the US, and in that, even then, they're sometimes ignored. We're competing against that. So I think you need both international treaties and the US needs its own uh, fairly strong regulation. Others? I could add to it. I mean, um, I think the chances of getting much through our Congress are pretty low, you know, to non-existent, probably for the foreseeable future. Um, but in the meantime, we are seeing some business mechanisms kick in. There's a group called CARES, which is C-E-R-E-S. And CARES is an institutional pension fund advisory firm. Um, that Their clients have a little over $7 trillion under management, so they're advising huge pension funds, CalPERS, New York State Pension Fund, New York State Employees Pension Fund, et cetera. And um, they've recently come out and, and they're pushing their members, so you know, pension funds, to push companies to disclose what they think their carbon overhang is. And you know, this is a real thing. So suddenly you've started having on earnings calls, um, the you know, heads of CalPERS or the institutional fund managers start asking the CEO and the CFO of McDonald's, well, what do you think your carbon overhang is? So this is going, we're at that sort of tip, we're approaching the tipping point, we're not there yet where this is no longer going to be just relegated to the sustainability group, which is either, at most companies, part of marketing, part of you know, legislative outreach, you know, PR, something like that, to now being owned by the CFO and really um, you know, being something that the CEO, CFO, will uh, really each equally be responsible for addressing on an earnings call. Um, I think that that, you know, to, your, to your question, could really play a big role in helping to accelerate this, because the more that that's actually 
institutionalized within the investors world or the investing world, um, that's going to be something that companies start to get re measured on more regularly across international boundaries. But but we're not there yet. If I could add one thing in regards to regulation too, um, we have a tendency uh, when people are trying to move forward to banning a substance. A BPA is actually a pretty good example right now. If you're, you know, you'll see BPA-free cans, but that just means that a company has come up with a compound that does something similar to BPA, which, great, we can ban BPA, but we need to be careful with our regulations and ensuring that we're not creating something worse or we're not creating something that's possibly more harmful to health or the environment. And right now, the way our regulatory system seems to be is it wants very specific guidelines. I want to ban this chemical or you need to give me very specific rules on what I can and can't use. And so I think they will need to be a little bit more overarching, um, which is going to be very difficult and is likely why it has not been attempted yet. So I wanted to say I was really excited to hear your question. Um, because when I was teaching um, first-year chemistry students this summer, I asked them the same question. The first week of class, we talked about climate change and the challenge of climate change. And then the second week of class, um, we actually read an article that talked about the Montreal Protocol um, and stratospheric ozone depletion. Of course, first-year undergraduates don't necessarily remember 1987. Um, and some of them weren't familiar with the fact that this happened. And the first thing they came up with was, well, if we could do this in 1987 and we came up with this Montreal Protocol and everyone has agreed to it and it's worked, why haven't we done this for climate change yet? Um, and they were really frustrated to hear that this had been done in the past and then we weren't able to do it with this current issue. Um, but they also had a lot of really interesting ideas that are outside of the scientific discipline that were really more in the policy and business ideas, and I would put them out as hypotheses as a scientist, someone who doesn't necessarily know what the answers are, but thinking about sort of the difference between regulating a reasonably small um, market substance, something like CFCs, versus fossil fuels that are such an integral part of our global economy, and thinking about sort of this is a much more difficult challenge that we're trying to deal with right now, um, but at the same time, I think it is inspiring that in the past we have been able to do this, and it has some suggestions of a possibility for success um, in being able to come up with a successful global policy solution. Um, but I think, I think it's easy to be disheartened by making the comparison, um, but at the same time, I think this is a really difficult challenge that we're trying to face and seeing that there are some business solutions that we can sort of try to put in place in the intervening time until we can come up with regulation that would actually be effective on the international stage is also quite heartening. And I'll just add one thing. I, I really appreciate the point that, that uh, the larger challenge of sustainability, whether it's climate or biodiversity or ocean acidification, is much more complex than removing CFCs from commerce was. And this is a tougher time to take on a big challenge than it was back then when we had more consensus uh, about environmental goals. So we need a variety of strategies. It's a very wicked, complex problem. We, we heard about regulation. We heard about market forces. We need both of those uh, in their appropriate places. And we also need culture change. So the fact that, that uh, millennials are driving cars much less than our generation did didn't result from regulation, didn't result from market forces. It's just a culture change that's happening. And, and I think that, the, that one of the most interesting areas is the, the, the interstices between regulation, market forces, and cultural trends. If we get those right and understand that complex interplay there, that's the way we'll make change that has to be as multifaceted as the change we need. Jim, I think that's a great note to kind of wrap this up. I think it's really inspiring to see the overlaps that your three departments have um, and that we can all kind of do our own part locally to improve on, on this global problem. Um, and so with that, I would like to thank you for your time. Thank you so much for being here. Um, and thank you, audience, for participating. Um, we have a CSF and GSF poster um, session now. It's the Campus Sustainability Fund and the Green Seed Fund are showcasing student-led and student-run projects all around campus. 
And so um, there's, there's food outside. Um, thank you so much for your time. And um, yeah, please enjoy the poster session. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah.